so much to everyone uh, for joining us today. My name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids, and I'm really excited to be hosting uh, this session. Um, and today we have our special guest, Dr. Mickey McCom. Kobza? Okay, but we're going to call it Dr. Mickey because I probably just messed that name up because the pressure is on to do it the right way. Um, and she's going to talk to you today about the amazing hammerhead shark, right? And uh, really, really incredible animals. Uh, not that all sharks aren't incredible. I, I mean, I'm hammerheads are my favorite, particularly gray hammerheads. Um, but Dr. Mickey is the executive director of the Ocean First Institute. Um, and her research focuses on sensory biology and ecological physiology of sharks and skates. Uh, she's going to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and let you get started. But thank you again to everyone joining us. Reminder, put your questions in the Q&A. And thank you, uh, Mickey, for joining us today and sharing some of your shark knowledge with us. We're excited to learn. All right, great. Well, thank you, Jillian, so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do is just to share um, with you a little bit about how I got interested in sharks in the first place and I want to share a little bit of the background about sharks and why they're such amazing creatures and dive into a, cute, a few very interesting species and share some information with you about them and then I want to talk about hammerheads and I want to share with you um, their unique story and why we think they have the weird head shape that they do and why that may be an advantage or perhaps even a disadvantage. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that and then I'll end with talking a little bit about the research um, that I'm doing currently uh, with hammerheads and why I feel that conservation work is so critically important. So I'm going to go ahead and get started by sharing my screen and uh, whoops, I'm so sorry, I didn't, forgot to go back, so I apologize. Um, all right, so uh, Jillian, can you see my screen and hear me okay? I can see and hear you perfectly. Everything looks okay. great. All right, perfect. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, I am going to share with you how I got interested in sharks in the first place. So I grew up in Colorado, so a landlocked state. Um, and everything. I spent a lot of time in nature. It was wonderful. Had a great childhood. And then things changed for me when I was seven years old. I went and I saw the movie Jaws. And I was terrified of sharks after leaving that movie theater with my brother. And I literally thought sharks were under my bed and under the kitchen table. So I was very scared. I had a shark problem. And I really had no idea how to overcome this uh, fear of sharks. And, um, you know, the movies that we see really do portray sharks as monsters. And so I started to read about sharks. And the more that I read about them, the more I started to understand that they are not monsters at all. And that was really a great um, opportunity for me to start talking about the truth about sharks and to try to get people to understand that they aren't these monsters that you see in the movies that are really silly, like Sharknado and, and all of the different Jaws movies. There's so many. Uh, shark movies that portray sharks as monsters. So really for me, since I was a very young girl, I've been trying to talk about the truth about sharks and to share their amazing story because it truly is a profound story um, of sharks on our planet. And um, so uh, when I got a little bit older, I moved down to the Florida Keys and I became a scuba instructor. That was one of my big dreams uh, is was to become a scuba instructor to spend more time underwater with sharks and to really get to know their behaviors and their movements and what they're like underwater and to share that with other people, other divers. And that was a really extraordinary time in my life. I got to be in the water for four or five hours a day. It was really amazing. And it opened up some doors for me to become a researcher. And so I ended up going back to school and got a PhD studying sharks. And uh, so I had some uh, a, a, a different variety of questions that I got to ask. I, I worked a lot on hormones in sharks early on, learning um, how hormones impact their growth and development. And then I moved into more uh, applied work in sensory biology, learning how sharks experience their world. How do they see? How do they use their senses in combination to allow them um, to be the perfect predators that they, they are? And so when we think about sharks, one of the things that I think is particularly hard is to understand time. 
And that's a really hard concept, I think, for us to get our arms around, but it's important in the story of the shark. So our universe is thought to be over 14 billion years old and our planet Earth over 4.6 billion years old. And when you look at it from space, it is planet ocean. Um, and because we have water on our planet, we have life. So life arose in the ocean and it got really big and interesting over 400 million years ago. And that's when we saw the first rise of jawed vertebrates and that included the sharks. And so it's incredible to think of some of the weird sharks through the fossil record um, that we had on our planet. So you can see here, this is a tooth in a rock. This is how we learn about sharks in the past. We learn about fossils. And this particular shark called Heliocoprion has what looks like a buzzsaw, um, a whirl um, shark in its uh, jaw of teeth. And so um, just an amazing to think about these interesting species that are no longer with us, but we're here on our planet. And remember, this is way before the time of the dinosaurs, which were around uh, 200 million years ago. We know we no longer have dinosaurs on our planet. Uh, scientists think a meteor came and, and took out the dinosaurs, um, but the sharks were here. And so the story of the shark really is a story of survival. Um, it's important to understand that. And sharks are closely related to animals called skates and rays. They're collectively called the elasmobranchs. And because they've been on our planet so long, they have moved into nearly every habitat on the planet. So we have sharks on the beautiful coral reefs. We have uh, these beautiful polka dot stingrays that live in the muddy waters of the Amazon basin. We have sharks like this Greenland shark that lives under ice in the polar regions and new research tells us this shark may live upwards of 400 years. How incredible. It may be the longest lived vertebrate on the planet. And we have sharks like this frilled shark um, that live in the deep ocean where sunlight doesn't even penetrate. So imagine living a lifetime in near virtual darkness and the adaptations that you might see in an animal experiencing that environment. So when we study sharks, again, it's important to understand there are over 500 different shark species swimming in the water today, all of which have different body shapes. They have different colors, different color patterns, different tooth shapes, different diets. Um, they use their sensory systems a little bit differently in combination. Um, so really, sharks are amazing creatures to study because of their tremendous diversity. And so I want to take you um, on, a, on a quick journey to look at a few species before we talk about hammerheads. This is the biggest shark in the ocean. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this shark. It's the whale shark. So whale sharks can get upwards of 50 feet long. Um, they're beautiful. They have polka dot markings. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. In, in one second, you'll see myself and my son swimming next to this whale shark. And the reason we can do that is because whale sharks are totally harmless. They are filter feeders and it's opening its mouth right there, filtering in tiny little plants and animals called plankton. Um, so the biggest bodies in the ocean are being built by nearly microscopic uh, ocean life. It's really quite amazing to think about that. Um, to go from the biggest to the smallest, this is the smallest shark, it's the dwarf lantern shark. And there is actually one species called the velvet belly lantern shark that glows in the dark. Yes, there are glow in the dark sharks, it's really incredible. It uses chemicals inside its body to create light called bioluminescence. So its belly glows green, matching the downwelling light. So this is a camouflage strategy employed by the velvet belly lantern shark. This is the fastest shark in the ocean, the mako shark. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. Mako sharks have one really interesting trick up their sleeves. So what you're looking at here is a mako shark that's coming in um, to a boat that has a camera positioned facing backwards. And those weird things you're seeing in the background are bait. And the mako shark is swimming in after this bait, which is really amazing. So these sharks have been clocked over 50 miles an hour. Um, and the strange and wonderful adaptation they have is they superheat their eyes. So the visual sense in these sharks is paramount. 
for them to be able to catch fast moving prey that they swim after every single day. So they, uh, they have a mechanism in their eyes to keep their eyes warmer than the ambient uh, ocean temperature, which is a tremendous advantage to allow that eye to work as well as it possibly can and be as fast as it possibly can in resolving the visual scene. So you can see that Mako clearly and easily is able to get these very fast moving fish. All right, one more really interesting uh, shark that I'd like to share is the big eye thresher shark. This shark has uh, a big eye, but the action in the shark is in its tail. You can see here it's got what's called a heterocercal tail. One lobe of the tail is longer than the other, and it uses it as a weapon to stun fish. So this is an adaptation in the tail to maximize the feeding um, success in this shark. And the tail whip is so fast, it breaks water molecules apart. So <laughs> the big eye thresher is a remarkable shark with an amazing adaptation. Okay, this next shark is really tremendously scary. It is probably the ugliest shark in the ocean. It's the goblin. The goblin shark has this really elongated nose called a rostrum, and it has very pointy um, dagger-like teeth, needle-like really, and they're pointed inward, which gives us a clue that as the goblin gets things into its mouth, they're not gonna be coming out. So from the front, you can see the shark is no more attractive <laughs> from the front than the side. And you can really see those needle-like teeth and that pronounced almost unicorn-like snout. Um, but the weirdness doesn't end with that with the goblin. One of the things it does that is very unique is that it's actually able to protrude out its jaws in order to capture and keep prey in its mouth. So this is remarkable. You can see this um, in the goblin shark video here. And this is very unique. Not many sharks can do this. And the goblin shark is an extreme example um, of this strategy. It's a deep sea shark. So it wants to be able to keep that food into its mouth. And this is a, an adaptation that we see in the goblin shark to do just that. All right, so with no further ado, let's move into hammerheads. So goblins have that strange head shape that's pulled forward. Hammerheads have this very elongated head called a cephalofoil. Um, hammerheads are newly evolved sharks. They're very new. Uh, around 20 million years ago, we started uh, to see the fossil record of hammerhead sharks. And uh, what's really interesting about them um, is that there is more than one hammerhead. Um, Jillian talked about her love of great hammerheads. So there are many hammerhead species and each of these hammerheads has um, a different uh, gradation of that cephalofoil expansion. So some are very modest and in uh, one of them called the bonnet head shark, you can see there. And then there's the great hammerhead, or I'm sorry, the scalloped hammerhead, which is kind of a hammerhead shark looking shark. And then on the bottom is what's called Euspira blockii. That is the wing head shark. Um, that is the most extreme morphology that we see in the hammerhead sharks. And uh, everything in between is, uh, is covered in all of these different species. And so what an amazing, uh, you know, morphology to look at and to, to ask questions about. Like, what does that head shape do for hammerheads? Is it advantageous in some ways? Is it disadvantageous? Um, that was a question that I asked uh, during my PhD. And uh, what a fun uh, question to ask. So this is what the most extreme hammerhead looks like. This is the winghead shark. Its distribution is fairly limited compared to other um, hammerhead sharks, and it's found in Indonesia and Northern Australia. Uh, and a very small shark, so not all hammerheads get really big. Several species may only grow to a meter and a half to two meters. So there's tremendous diversity even within hammerheads um, with their body size. Um, and their head shape. So here is an x-ray of a scalloped hammerhead head. And what I want you to take away from this is just to think about how the cranium, so that uh, chondrocranium has expanded in this shark and what that has done to a lot of the features 
and sensory structures inside of this shark. So the eyes are now moved quite far apart. And if you look um, closely, you'll see the mouth and the, uh, the jaw. And then just in front of that are these two really big capsules that go all the way out to the eyes. That's actually the olfactory capsule. That's the, 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 in the nose of the shark. So you can see that's huge and quite large in the hammerhead. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. So again, think about these sensory structures and how they've been stretched out and, and what that shape might mean for hammerheads. So there's been a lot of different hypotheses or ideas that have been put forward to explain why the hammerhead head may be advantageous or disadvantageous. And one of those hypotheses is that it is what is what we call hydrodynamic. So you've heard of aerodynamic airplanes. Um, think about the hammerhead head as being hydrodynamic. So it can cut through water very, very easily because it has a very sharp edge. So if you look at that aircraft on the left, that's called a canard aircraft. You can see it has wings in the front and wings in the back. That's very similar to what you would see in a hammerhead. And um, canard aircraft do cut through the air very effectively, just as hammerheads do too. So there is evidence to suggest that there is a hydrodynamic um, uh, advantage in having that head shape. So that's one thing. There's another, and that is the maneuverability of these sharks. So um, Jillian knows very well because she swims with hammerheads quite often. She sees the way they cut through the water, the way that hammerheads maneuver around um, while she's filming them. And it's amazing because they are incredibly maneuverable with that head shape and that body that follows. So maneuverability with the hammerhead is also something that is supported as an advantage to having that head shape. One of the other interesting ideas that has been put forward is that, um, that many hammerheads eat stingrays. And stingrays, as you know, spend time on the bottom of the seafloor. And there's been anecdotal or there's been observations. People have seen hammerheads pin stingrays down and uh, bite off their wings and feed on them. Um, so that is an interesting um, use of the head to help them feed. However, not every hammerhead species eats stingrays and is big enough to eat stingrays. So in some species, this is observed, but not in all. So we don't think that that's probably a driver of why the hammerhead has that head shape. And then I'm going to get to one of the last um, uh, questions about hammerhead heads and that's one that interested me the most and that's the sensory function. So taking a look at the um, sensory systems in this weird head shape. So having eyes on the ends of the hammers pointing straight out. What does that mean to the way the shark sees its world? Um, having those nostrils, the sense of smell set so far apart, um, does that have an impact in the way that shark can sense um, odors in the water column. Um, so a lot of really interesting questions can be asked using hammerhead sharks as a model to try to understand how that head shape may help or hinder them. So one of the questions that I was very interested in was the visual system. So the shark's eye positioning on the head, um, I wanted to know if that had an impact on the way hammerhead saw the world versus normal pointed nose sharks. And so the question really was, can hammerheads even see straight ahead when they're swimming through the water? And what that equates to is having binocular vision. So each eye's independent field needs to overlap in front for there to be binocular vision. And binocular vision is important because it facilitates depth perception. So it's really important. So I looked at the visual fields of many different hammerheads as well as regular sharks to see what um, I could find out, to see what their visual fields were. So I used a technique called an electroretinogram. So an electroretinogram is a technique where uh, I shine light onto a shark's eye and it sends an electrical signal that I can record on a computer and it allows me to know whether the shark is seeing um, a light stimulus. 
And so what I was able to do is to shine light all the way around um, the shark's head in a uh, laboratory to figure out what is its visual field. So we would anesthetize the sharks, use this method to record their eyes responses to light from different angles, and we were able to then reconstruct its entire visual field. And what we found was really exciting um, and quite a surprise, honestly. So we found that all sharks we tested do have binocular overlaps in front of their head. Um, that's really great. But what we found that was so surprising is that the degree of overlap increased in the hammerheads, which was definitely not what I thought was going to happen. So we started to see bigger and bigger degree overlaps in the hammerheads, the scalloped hammerhead, the bonnet head, and the winghead shark was the biggest of all. And really the reasoning why is because of the position of the eyes on the ends of the hammerhead head are canted slightly forward and that gives them all that advantage of having those large overlaps. And so you can see here in this little um, video what the visual field of a hammerhead looks like. So the green area is what it can see. And so you can see that binocular overlap is there in front of the head, but you can kind of notice it's kind of far away. So the shark can't really see what's right in front of its head. And so there's these blind spots that we um, measured in the hammerheads and all sharks. And that was another surprise that they couldn't see really close to their own head. So there was this visual blind spot um, where they couldn't see anything at all. And so those blind spots were quite large in the hammerheads um, and also in uh, the, the pointed nose sharks, but just not as wide because of the hammerhead head, um, the, the area was much bigger. So that got me to thinking, well, if they can't see something right in front of their head and they're hunting and they're trying to get food or fish or crabs or whatever into their mouth, um, how are they doing it if they can't see? And so one of the other uh, senses that sharks have is called the electrosense. And so every living thing gives off a weak electric field. You give off an electric field when you go in the water, fish give off an electric field, and sharks have evolved to detect it. And they detect it through a system called the ampullae of Lorenzini. So if you look at the underside of this bonnet head, you see all those little peppery dots. Those are little jelly-filled canals that allow the shark to feel or sense weak electric fields given off by prey. And so the sharks use this at a very close range to detect their prey. So the question I had is if they have this big blind spot, do they perhaps use that other sensory system um, to compensate for it? So here's the interesting part. We actually were able to do experiments to figure out how low the stimulus could be to uh, get sharks to respond to these weak electric fields and also try to figure out how far away or how far out from the head um, they could detect these weak electric fields. So we did an experiment where we started to, where we used a small battery to create a weak uh, electric field underwater. Um, so we used our own battery to do it. And then we um, would flip the switch and the sharks would come in and actually bite at um, our weak electric fields. And so you can see this is a bonnet head here and the bonnet head is coming in and actually biting at the sand. Um, there's nothing there except our, our weak electric field we're generating. So it was such a cool experiment to see the sharks using this system in response to the battery um, and the electric field we were generating. And so again, the value to this was to be able to figure out um, a detection distance. So what I'm gonna show you now is a video um, of experiments I ran on uh, black nose sharks at Moat Marine Lab. And whoops, I'm so sorry. And what you'll see is the black nose coming in and biting at uh, my, uh, my weak electric field that I'm generating. And what I can do is create a distance from where the shark is behaviorally orienting towards that dipole. And so I can calculate how far out the shark can sense that uh, weak electric field. And that's exactly what I was able to do with um, hammerhead sharks as well as regular sharks to see how far out that sense went. And when I mapped it out, um, it was fascinating. 
I found that those blind spots um, were perfectly covered by the electrosensory system detection distance. So in other words, these sharks are perfectly tuned to their environment and they use their sensory systems in combination in a phenomenally precise way. So really exciting um, findings and really interesting um, work. So the question is, how does this knowledge help us? Um, why do we study sharks? Why do we want to know more about them? Um, why, what does that do uh, for us or for them? And really, uh, for me, I have enjoyed the research that I've done on sensory systems and endocrinology, but a lot of the work that I do now is more conservation focused because sharks are in trouble, many species, including um, the hammerheads. Hammerheads are having a very hard time right now uh, because of overfishing. And so I'm here in Costa Rica where I do research and I'm tagging a small scalloped hammerhead right here. You can see this is just a baby. And uh, this little hammerhead is getting a tag. And then we're gonna release this hammerhead back into the water, into the wild um, of Costa Rican waters. And we're able to track it and figure out where it's moving. And the reason this particular project was important to me is it turned out that this area, uh, my colleagues, uh, found out that it is a, a shark nursery area. So this is where the pups are born. It's a critical area that needs to be protected. And in 2018, the Costa Rican president declared it a hammerhead shark sanctuary, the world's very first. So I'm so proud um, of the work that my friends have done down in Costa Rica. And we have expanded uh, many projects um, down in Costa Rica to understand the movement and the best ways that we can protect um, some of these animals. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop um, sharing my screen and uh, I would love to answer questions if you have any of me. Great, well thank you so much. Really um, just a, an absolutely fascinating animal. Um, obviously I'm a bit biased because they are, <laughs> are just amazing and for anyone who's seen a shark in general underwater, it's it, a, an amazing experience. They're beautiful animals, they're intelligent, the way they move their behaviors, their personalities. Uh, but hammerheads overall are just really super powered to some of the sensory systems you talked about. Uh, and just, yeah, really, really an amazing animal. Sadly though, you know, many of them, the great hammerheads critically endangered now. So this conservation work and the work we've been talking about, guys that have been watching these webinars, it's this is why this is important. This is why science research, collecting that data, understanding where these nursery habitats are, are critical for conservation because the populations of these species are going down. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. All right, so first question I like to ask, um, we've had a few people, including Autumn, who wanted to know, do you have a favorite shark and what is it? I do. Uh, I do love scalloped hammerheads. I know, Jillian, you like greats. Um, I love scalloped hammerheads I, just because I've worked with them so much. I worked with them in Hawaii. Um, I worked with them um, down in Costa Rica. I just love them. I love the little ones and just knowing that, you know, when you, when you're tagging some of these animals, you're hoping so much that they have a big future and that they'll be able to grow up and have their own shark pups and have a chance at, you know, really repopulating um, this, uh, you know, in areas that really, you know, they used to be in, in great numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've not seen the, um, the ones in Hawaii at that, that lab that does have the, the juveniles, the pups, but my husband got to film out there and just their giant head and the little body, they're just, I mean, it's amazing. I would love to, to see that. Just, they look like, I mean, really they have to grow into their head because it's so big on their little body, but yeah, just uh, uh, such a fascinating animal. All right, so uh, Sydney, who I believe, Sydney, thank you for joining us again. I'm pretty sure you've been on every single one of the calls. You are a rock star. You are a shark scientist by now, Sydney. Um, Sydney would like to know why you chose this career or this job, which has kind of evolved over time, but maybe where you're, where you're currently at, the work you're doing. Yeah, you know, it's been a long journey for me. As I mentioned in the beginning, I was scared of sharks as a little girl. I was terrified and started to read about them. And that, you know, has hooked me for life. That fascination has never left me. Every day I'm trying to learn more or spend more time underwater with sharks. And um, one of the things I've learned, as I mentioned, a lot of my uh, early work was on physiology and sensory biology. And I've moved more into conservation. And I do a lot of outreach. So the research I do, I feel 
is most useful if I'm able to share it with as many people as possible because the story of the shark is so fascinating and they need our help. Uh, and so I feel, you know, by sharing that story as widely as I can, I hope to inspire other people to care about sharks and to ensure that they have a place at the table because they certainly deserve um, to be able to survive and thrive in the ocean today. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's, and I think you see a lot of, you know, science, it, it's needed for conservation. And I've said this, those of you who have watched my, when I'm hosting is talk about, or, you know, I talked about some of the intro to shark science, the equipment that's used on Monday is, is just really, um, it's not enough to say, oh, I love sharks. We need that. We need people to love sharks and to care, but we have to have the, this data, the science to support that, to go to governments, to get areas and nurseries and breeding grounds protected. And, and that's why it's so, so important for, for conservation. So this work is, obviously it's really interesting. Um, studying sharks is amazing, working with them, the things that you learn when you're tagging them, seeing where they're going, but it's critical for conservation. It's, it's, it has to be there. So those of you that are watching that are really interested um, in science and conservation, there are gonna be so many questions that still need answering by the time you're studying sharks. New species being discovered, new equipment being developed. So yeah, if you're interested in this work, stick with it, follow your passion because there are still so many questions. Um, and, and you know, Dr. Mickey's not talking about research she did 20, 30 years ago. This is recent and we're still, you know, some of these species she highlighted, we know very little about deep sea. So it, it should, just highlights how important this work is. And I also wanna say, for any of the girls watching, this is for you as well. All right, this is our Women in Science Week, and so it's really important to, a lot of times you, you might see uh, male scientists doing this on TV shows or you know on the internet, but women are doing this too. So don't, don't think that this isn't something you can do. Uh, it's very much, if you're interested and passionate about it, um, you know, check out this week, follow, uh, you know, you can see Mickey's pages and websites and, and we've given you a lot of information to follow, ask questions, stay up to date with what's happening and, and ways to get involved. So uh, very, very important to remember that this is for the, the boys, uh, young men watching as well, but also just a reminder for the young ladies that this is, this is also for you. And we need more female scientists. So if you're interested, stick with it. All right, so um, Xavier wanted to know, and we had a couple people asking, um, is it the great hammer head or the wing head? Which one has the widest head? Yeah, the widest head belongs to the wing head. So the wing head is so bizarre, it has its own genus. So it's called Euspira blockii. So it's different than all the other spearnid sharks, um, which are all of the rest of the hammerhead. So um, wing heads are very uh, interesting. And what's also really, really bizarre um, if you're a super shark sleuth, um, look into this. But when we look at the age of the hammerheads and the speciation of hammerheads, what we see is remarkable. We see that the winghead sharks are the basal shark and that the bonnet head with the very almost normal looking head is the most recent. So we almost have a uh, gradual shift back to a normal head in hammerheads, which is very interesting if you think about it. Right, I'm just going through some of those. All right, um, Alina would like to know, you talked about diving with sharks, and what, what was the first shark you ever saw? First shark I ever swam with was a nurse shark down in Florida, um, and it blew my mind because they're absolutely beautiful. Their skin um, is almost metallic electric, and uh, they're gorgeous, and they have barbels, and they have attitudes, and they're sweet, and, um, you know, uh, that, was, uh, that was an amazing moment for me to, to see that shark up close and to, to be able to spend time underwater with it. And, and I would just follow, and I know Jillian, you know this and feel this every day, but when you swim with sharks and you look them in the eye, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to be underwater with these ancient animals that struggle to survive every day. Um, I've swam with great white sharks and tiger sharks and bull sharks and a lot of the ones that people consider to be dangerous. And, I feel I feel the opposite. I feel like it is an honor to 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 be able to even see them in in the wild and to share space with them. It's a, a unique privilege, and I encourage all of you to become divers because it is the most important tool to having the ocean open up for you um, for all kinds of questions. 
Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Find, learn how to dive, go snorkeling, see these animals up close. Um, nurse sharks are still one of my favorites for a shark I ever saw, for a shark ever tagged. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, just amazing. But you'll notice is each shark, sometimes they all get grouped together. They're all sharks, but each shark has really unique features. Um, and you know, they do have personalities. And, and we see that a lot with the great hammerheads and bimini. And when you spend enough time with the same sharks, you see that, and I, I people are always like, "What? They have personalities? That, <laughs> what are you talking about?" They do. Some are bold, some are shy, and yeah. yeah, there's a lot more to these animals than just their teeth and the the things that we hear about. Uh, really, really remarkable creatures. So, uh, one of the best ways to to learn about them and to to get you know that experience is snorkeling and diving, and you don't have to live by the ocean. I think Colorado has the highest per capita of, shirt of scuba divers in the world or somewhere in the U.S. It's crazy, but I get it. Like, people love the ocean. Um, and it's a way for you to, you know, people that are interested in, in helping the ocean as well. So, all right. So, um, this, is, <laughs> this is a fun one. Marcus wants to know, how do you think the hammerhead knows where its mouth is? Because obviously it's not <laughs> seeing it. But I mean, we also, we don't see our mouths unless we're looking in the mirror. We kind of, I guess, aim, you no. know, we, don't, we have silverware and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think sharks are, you know, they're kind of spatially aware. So I have a little model here, so you can see the mouth here of a, of a great white shark. I think what's interesting, though, to note about the hammerheads, and I, and I have this, uh, a silly kind of little doll here, but I'll bring it on anyway. So one of the interesting things about the hammerhead mouse, and this is something I didn't get to talk about, there might be a bit of a disadvantage with hammerheads. They are very susceptible to, to uh, mortality, to dying if they're hooked onto a line. And one of the reasons we think this is, is because their mouths are very small um, in comparison to the rest of their body. And they are what we call ram ventilators. They need to continually swim pushing water over their gills, um, allowing them to have oxygen in their blood. And so hammerheads sometimes with a small mouth might not be getting that flow. And that might be one of the reasons why um, they are not good candidates for, uh, you know, release fishing and bringing them to shore, take pictures and saying, oh, they're fine, I'll put them back. They're not really fine. They are very, very fragile species. And that might be one of the reasons. So interesting question, interesting, uh, interesting thought. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's been a lot of, University of Miami did a, a bunch of look, you know, work with that, and I think it was something over 80% of the post-release mortality, and, and so I know that's definitely kind of influencing um, fishing regulations in Florida. It needs to be better, but we're getting, you know, it's one step at a time, and we actually had David ask us if there is a demand or an opportunity for recreational fishermen to insist in, in tagging and gathering, you know, DNA and things like that, and I think, I mean, you can probably touch upon this, but NOAA has tags. Um, if you guys check that out, I, you know, they make it very accessible. They offer um, information. I know there are seminars on how to properly handle the shark, the, the hooks you're using, things like that. Um, you know, is that kind of, I think that's what probably the most well known is sort of the NOAA recreational program. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, fishermen um, are, are smarter than a lot of the scientists, to be honest, because they're out there every single day. They read the water. They know the animals better than anybody else because they're touching them every day. They're catching them. They know where they go. They know how they move. They know seasonality. Um, fishermen are incredibly smart and they're very intuitive in what they know and to to utilize their skill sets in helping collect data um, is is a huge resource and something that I think um, a lot of the uh, United States fisheries agencies are, are really trying to to try to capitalize on because this is a huge effort and it takes an army of people who are committed and in the right place at the right time and so certainly that's a great opportunity yeah and I think too when you talk about when we find areas um, you know, I know one of the areas that we went to tag tiger sharks, we went there because fishermen said, we're seeing huge tiger sharks. Uh, oh, yeah. it, it was kind of a needle in a haystack. If we, we, it's the ocean, right? We know they're around, but we got some direct points because they were out there every day saying, you know what, we see these sharks, we see them this time of year, and that data is valuable. They weren't targeting sharks, but they were seeing them. And so it made it a lot easier for us to go find the sharks we were looking for. And I think that's all over the world is, it's a resource and you, you wanna bring everyone together and for conservation to be successful, all members of the community have to be involved, all the stakeholders. And, and that's where you really see conservation success stories 
um, even if it's getting fishermen to maybe stop fishing for sharks in a certain area, like with the whale sharks, and now there's a lot of ecotourism or dive guides. Um, so yeah, but it's because people were working together and the community came together and scientists approached, you know, working with them instead of against them. And I think that, you know, that's a success story. So, um, pretty cool. So uh, a couple of people have asked, you know, what is the most challenging or the hardest part of studying sharks or maybe in some of the work that you did? Um, you know, I think for, for me, uh, probably some of the hardest work I did um, was, uh, you know, really based in the lab. Um, I was doing endocrinology um, in the, uh, and, and there were no kits that were in existence to measure some of the hormones I was measuring. And so I had to be very creative and inventive in the lab in trying to be able to um, show evidence that the hormones I was binding were the ones that I was thinking I was binding. And so there was a lot of work that had to be done behind the scenes to even get to uh, the answer. So it was, you know, there's a lot of back work in science to make things validated and to work. Um, and in sensory biology, we were working in the lab, we had to catch sharks in the field, transport them successfully back to the lab, get them into tanks and acclimate them, get them feeding successfully, get them happy. And then we would anesthetize them and put them into um, uh, experimental conditions for a few hours to obtain data. We would revive the sharks, get them feeding again, and when uh, we would release them. Um, that's a lot of work for one person to do. We would be doing experiments where I was ventilating. I was running my ERGs. It's a lot of work. But again, these sharks are the ambassadors that allowed us to understand some of the fundamental questions about their biology and then release them back into the wild. And that, to me, was one of the proudest moments um, in my career was to be able to get these answers and release the sharks back. Um, that's an important part, I think, of the puzzle, is if you're working on a species that is endangered, the last thing you want to do is harm more of them um, in your work. So it's a, it's a balance. And uh, yeah, so I think that's the hardest part. And I also think uh, having research stay in the academic confines is another really challenging thing. I love outreach and talking to people, and that has been um, a driving force for my career um, uh, forever. And it's important. It's important that the general public understands what the research is doing so they can make informed decisions as well about what's going on. So sure. that is a, a really important component. And, you know, I've mentioned to on a few of these talks is, you know, you guys heard Dr. Mickey say she had to create something to, to answer the questions because it wasn't just, you know, go to the store and go, oh, I need three of those. Uh, so there's a lot of engineering that goes into this work. So even if you're not, you don't want to be a sharp scientist, Maybe you're really good at building things and creating things and you want to be an engineer and you might engineer a special tag or a test kit or something. I mean, that's the thing is this is really important as well uh, because, yeah, a lot of it, it doesn't exist. We have questions we want to ask. We want to find answers, but we have to connect those points. And it, it's not as simple as just grabbing, okay, this, this, and, and you get creative, which I think is also really interesting and challenging, but definitely an interesting aspect to it. Um, and Kiefer, thank you. You've joined us for quite a few of these as well. Uh, do you see any different behaviors uh, among the hammerhead sharks than other sharks? Maybe, you know, feeding behaviors or things like that? Yeah. So you can see behind here, this is a, uh, a school or a shiver of hammerhead sharks. And what we see um, in, these in this particular species is they will group together, they sexually segregate. So we'll have females, and males um, separated. And there is a social hierarchy in these schools of hammerhead. So there are dominant females um, who are controlling where the, the sharks are moving, controlling what's happening in the positioning of where the sharks are in the school. So there is an intelligence in with these animals that we didn't understand before. And again, there's so much we don't know. We're just now learning. And with cheaper technologies like cameras and GoPros and all of these different techniques, things that we're inventing, we're learning with more eyes under the sea what these animals are doing, what their behaviors are, are uh, telling us about their ecology and their biology. So, um, you know, definitely schooling is a behavior we see in hammerheads. It's not unique to hammerheads, but it is definitely um, unique to scalloped hammerheads to see them in the vast numbers that we see them in. 
Absolutely. Um, do you have a favorite moment that you've had either diving with sharks or studying them? Ooh, that's tough. Um, you know, I, oh my gosh, that's so hard. Um, you know, I think, um, I'm going to share two because <laughs> it's so hard. Um, really amazing opportunity in Guadalupe. Um, I think you've been there as well, Guadalupe, uh, Mexico with great white sharks. They um, swim around cages. You're about 30 feet down. I was uh, down sunset with some friends and we were circled by three very large uh, females. Um, the sun was dappling down. They were swimming ever closer, um, checking us out. It was absolutely magical. Um, we came up from that dive hooting and screaming and yelling. And, you know, these are moments that will stay with you forever. You never forget um, the connections you've made, not only with the sharks, but with your friends as well. And then I remember another really fun experience. It was in the, in the Exumas. I was with uh, middle school kids that we were down, uh, we were doing uh, diving and I had them looking for treasure. We were treasure hunting, which was very fun um, with a metal detector. And all of a sudden we looked over and again, sun coming down, a huge great hammerhead swam by and just absolutely took my breath away. I started to cry in my mask <laughs> because it was just more than I could handle. And I thought to myself, here are middle school students seeing this on one of their very first dives, how profound and amazing and hopefully life altering these magical moments are to them. Um, so seeing these animals underwater live, there's no way to describe how amazing it is. And I hope each and every one of you become divers and have those experiences on your own because they're, you'll never forget them. They, they become part of you. Yeah, I agree. Those moments underwater, just to see an animal, it's spectacular. There's nothing like it. They're really, really special. And, you know, I think you hear a lot of people that work with these animals describe that and it never gets old. Um, you know, it's, I still get excited when I see nurse sharks and some people are like, yeah, it's a nurse shark. I, it's still an amazing, like we're sharing the space with these animals in a world that we don't belong in, but we get to visit because we've got some special equipment, which is just yeah, it's incredible. And to be a middle school student getting to that, that would have been <laughs> incredible. And it's very amazing that, you know, these opportunities are available. Um, and I'm going to finish with um, my uh, question is, what advice for young women, girls uh, watching, what advice, um, it probably applies to everyone watching, but uh, would you give them for pursuing a career in, in marine science or shark science? I would say, um, you know, for, for my personal story, I, um, I just never gave up and I, I didn't believe, um, I don't know, I didn't know enough to think that I couldn't do it and I just kept knocking on doors, I kept pursuing opportunities, um, I just felt like it was what I needed to do and I felt um, after spending time as a diver, and a dive instructor seeing um, what's happening to sharks, I felt personally compelled to try to help and to do everything I could every day to help sharks. And that was my North Star, that was my compass. And so everything I did was for them to try to help them. And uh, you know, knocking on doors and being uncomfortable sometimes or being the only woman on a boat, it didn't matter to me because I was there for a purpose, a bigger purpose than myself. Um, and I think if you're interested in this um, as a career, um, that's a really good guidepost is to know that you're doing this because you care about something very much. And it means a lot to you to go out and protect um, nature. We need nature more than ever before. And I think we're all starting to recognize that. And uh, so to be part of a group of people who spend and dedicate their lives to preserving nature and animals like sharks um, is a calling, and, uh, and, and, and I think if you, if you put your mind to it and you put your heart into it, you will succeed. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mickey, for your time and sharing these amazing experiences and, and knowledge with us, and, and thank you so much to all the uh, participants who joined us to watch. Um, if you missed part of it or you just want to watch it again, it's going to be on our YouTube channel a little bit later. Um, you can also check on the Sharks for Kids website. We have all the links if you want to follow, learn a little bit more about the ocean first. 
uh, Institute, some of the opportunities for students there, um, and learn a little bit more about Dr. Mickey's work. But thank you guys. Thank you for your time. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.